Hi, I'm here with David Wright. He is Chief Innovation Officer at ServiceNow, and we're gonna talk about his role as Chief Innovation Officer, uh, innovation obviously, and the Now platform that's being updated. Hi, David, thanks for joining us. Hey, Larry, thanks for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. So walk me through your role and, and kind of where it fits in the CXO pecking order at ServiceNow. Okay, so, so I report straight through to Bill McDermott, our CEO. And my role, my role's got kind of multiple elements to it. So one of it is uh, an evangelist type role. So I spend a lot of time explaining to people what ServiceNow does as a company, what the potential is of the platform, whereabouts we could go and some of the futures. But most of my time spent looking at what's happening from a, a technology trend perspective that might have impact on us in the future. And that could be not just the tech side, but some of the social side as well. So it could be, it could be things like uh, IoT, it could be 5G, it could be generational impact of things like Gen Alpha, how are these people gonna work? And then based on a lot of these concepts, it's then having conversations with the people who own the products about, well, whereabouts could we go next? And, and is this gonna be something that's fundamental to us in, in what we do for the platform and how we build out products going forward? So there's, there's that whole concept of of looking at things that are relevant for us, but there's also things where people want an opinion on what are you thinking about quantum compute? What are you thinking about blockchain? Uh, what are you thinking about future trends in automation? So so some of the presentations are kind of tangential to what we do as a core business, but it's, it's understanding all that technology and then whereabouts it could affect us in the future. What, what kind of time frame do you look at for thinking forward? So I can't really, I mean, realistically, I don't like to go much beyond three years, maybe, maybe push it to four at the outside, but I, I find after that, it's kind of it's kind of difficult because I always hate the question, hey, where do you think something will be in 10 years? I, I don't think anyone can predict what's gonna happen in 10 years from a technology perspective. Just the, it's not just the, it's not just the amount of change that's happening, but it's also the, the acceleration of the race of change. I mean, things just change so quick that, that I think there's a, a limited time span of, of how much you can predict out. So for me, it's looking at things that could produce uh, a significant amount of business in the next three to four years. So basically your, your view to innovation is really revolved around the product cycle too, for the most part, right? Because you guys are kind of on a three year, I mean, you update all the time, but you know, once you start getting to 10 years, it's kind of hard to envision how products look. Yeah, uh, and you know, the other element that that doesn't really take into account is is acquisition. So it might be that you want to move into an area that you're either not known for or that you haven't got technical expertise in. So so again, that could come down to, well, do we want to move into this area from a strategic perspective? And if so, do we need to do certain acquisitions to get into this area? And again, you know, if you try and predict 10 years into the future, you don't even know what companies will exist in 10 years, so you can't have an acquisition strategy around it. How, how do you decide what technologies to build versus buy? So that's interesting because the the flexibility of the platform means you can build so much stuff on it. But it's the question is, should you build on it all the time? The platform's designed for the platform's designed for being very good for managing service management solutions. It was originally designed to be able to just manage forms-based workflow across the enterprise. So take data that needs to be moved around the enterprise that needs to be acted upon. So first of all, you have to think, well, well, is this something that's going to be a relatively easy fit for this? Or is it something where we're going to have to change some of the infrastructure back end to be able to, to process and be able to consume it? And then, con well, consummation, uh, how you consume it becomes a, another interesting issue as well. So is this something that the sales force could sell? Is it something that the sales force understands? Uh, how do we actually go about being able to build a market and a go-to market around this? How long would it take us to get expertise? And this can go from everything from what we do on a technology perspective all the way through to what we do on a, a verticals perspective. So, so with that data flow and you know, sort of process construct, so to speak, that, that's how you guys wound up from you know, IT service management into HR and other areas? So that's interesting. So this, 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 is, this is more about changing the way that people think. So, so although we started off building an IC service management app, fundamentally at the, the background of all this is the ServiceNow platform, which was designed to be able to to be able to process all these different workflows. Now, 
what you realize pretty quickly when you start to speak to people is, is almost everything can be defined as one of three things in my mind. People either want something they haven't got, they want something they've got fixed or changed, or they want to know something. And that really doesn't matter whether it's inside work, outside of work, in IT, outside of IT. Almost anything you do from hiring a new employee to getting a car service to getting a new laptop to booking a dentist appointment, it's all the same process. You're either generating a request that needs to be actioned, you're saying there's an issue with something that people need to deal with to fix, or you're just trying to find out how to do something. Now, if I just think in those terms, I don't really need to understand anything about the core business. So I can go and speak to someone in legal, for example, not knowing anything about the way lawyers work on a day-to-day -day basis, but I can talk to them about how do they manage the workload that comes into the company? How do they assign the workload out? How do they, how do they measure the processes that they're doing? How do they store the knowledge? How do they establish whether they're getting better or worse at something or whether it's even something they want to focus the time on and having conversations like that kind of drove this natural evolution so when we went out and we started building it solutions what happened was customers naturally started to evolve so what had happened is you'd see human resources say well the way people request and consume things from it why couldn't we do that so then they started to ask for portions of the IT catalog to say, well, where you publish all your IT services, we'd like to publish all our HR services as well. And then that kind of branched out from that to where it was not just HR, it was the whole concept of employee workflows. So how do I do everything from onboarding to case management to moments that matter? So people coming in and getting married or changing names or needing alterations to addresses how do you how do you just take a simple request like that and propagate it across everything else in the environment so a lot of this was was customers just coming to us with a demand that they wanted to do something and over time that evolved into being full-blown blown products and full-blown business units as well so it's been a an evolution rather than a revolution and now that's going to evolve into verticals and industries correct absolutely absolutely it's uh Again, it's the, same, it's the same issues most people face from a vertical perspective, but when you start to look at how people manage things like finance or telco or manufacturing or the healthcare industry, they haven't really got very specific processes in place to be able to manage workflow across those. So we can go in and we can speak to a, a finance company and they could have services that they provide. It could be credit card applications. It could be... Um, complex process examples it could be things like payments execution how do they actually orchestrate that workflow across all the different systems and how do they allow people to come in and consume it because that's that's been one of the the interesting things that we've seen happen in service now it's this concept of people saying well I want to consolidate down and have a certain number of platforms that my business operates on and it might be your fintech platform, your ERP platform, your CRM, your HRM. As that consolidation goes on, you find more and more workflows that actually move from system of record to system of record in order to get things done. So a lot of the, the evolution of ServiceNow is to become this, this system of action that sits across all the systems of record that allows you to do complex workflows. So if you look at something like onboarding, for example, although onboarding seen as a a human resources activity, it generates work for IT, it generates work for finance, it generates work for facilities. So how do you coordinate all those things together to be able to get to a point where you've actually got an employee coming on board? So so a lot of this is 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 looking at the potential total addressable market. And everywhere you go, you find more and more use cases for what people can do with the platform and how they can use it. And, and even though we've started to focus on verticals this year with finance and telco, we still find customers building applications that do everything from student management through to mortgage applications, through to hospital and patient management. People go out there and build these solutions themselves. So it's been, it's always interesting for me to go to a customer and then see exactly what it is they've managed to do with the platform. So the now platform or the latest update that's out it's it has a lot of automation and artificial intelligence embedded um, what, 
what's that roadmap look like and, and kind of what's the role of AI and automation in terms of workflows and things like that? So, so AI for us has been a, it's been an evolution. We've done, we've done eight different acquisitions in the world of AI. So we, we started looking at this kind of uh, 2014, 2015 to understand whereabouts we could go. And then towards the end of uh, 2016, we did our first acquisition, which was a company called DX Continuum. So we, we started off by building a core machine learning engine. So this is where we're going to be able to take a corpus of data from a customer, actually build the ML models and be able to deploy it for that customer to do basic functionalities like categorization, assignment, prioritization. So that was kind of the first element we went through. And in parallel to that, we, uh, we started to develop virtual agent technologies. So that was looking at how can we, how can we not just use a virtual agent to allow people to serve themselves, which is the prime virtual agent use. I come in, I, I chat with the virtual agents, I, I get the answers to the questions that I want. But also how could we take that and take that virtual agents and use it as a virtual assistant to actually allow the people on the back end when they're working on issues to constantly have a bot that's out there looking for similar issues that happen on the system, looking for knowledge that might be relevant, suggesting next steps, being actually to get moving towards that prescriptive elements of being able to explain to people how to solve issues. Then we had other various acquisitions around what we did with natural language understanding to enhance the virtual agents, natural language query to be able to look at how we could get people to interrogate systems without needing to know SQL structures to be able to write select statements. We, we did acquisitions around what we did to enhance the search engine. And then most recently we've done uh, two acquisitions that are, are in flow now with passage.ai and loom.ai to look at what we can do around the world of AI ops and what we can do around the world of simultaneous translation to allow people to be able to, to work in multiple languages at the same time. For me, for me, what AI is being able to allow us to do is be able to deal with the, the massive influx of data that we constantly get all the time. So, so data's, data's just continually growing and eventually you get to the point where there's just too much to consume. So for me, AI was never a nice to have. It was never a feature. AI was an, an inevitability. You have to have AI to be able to understand everything that's happening. Now the, the spin-off effects of this to be able to, to look at data and be able to start to predict when things were going to happen or, or even better to be able to get to the point where you were prescriptive and you had things like recommendation engines where you could say, I see this event happening. I think the knock-on effect is going to be this is going to happen. And in order to avoid this, I'm going to suggest that you do this. That means you can process so much data in parallel and be able to get so much more efficiency across the organization that, that it just enables people to continue to have the capacity to work moving forward. I think the, the other thing that AI has given people is the ability to remove some of the mundane tasks. So things like using virtual agent technology for call deflection to help people solve their own problems, that's been a, a great benefit that we've seen. But also looking at how we start to analyze things and understand repetitive tasks and see can we actually automate some of those repetitive tasks that's been a, an amazing step forward as well i guess what's the state of digital transformation in your view at this point so i mean digital transformation has always been a an interesting thing for me larry because everyone for, for the start everyone's treated it like some kind of new thing but i've been in technology for well 30 years now and people have always been looking at the latest technology to see how can they improve what they do. So, you know, you've seen all these transitions of, of technology, be it the introduction of different form factors or be it the introduction of things like different databases to be able to, to look at how you optimize performance and get more out of a system. But I think when I, when I look at customers now, the, the big difference I'm seeing is the, there's like a, a duality of digital transformation. So digital transformation in the past has always been about how do I establish this digital foundation? It's about how do I how do I take technology to make what I currently do better? So how do I just improve the processes? How do I automate the processes? How do I speed things up? The, the more interesting phase of digital transformation is how do I actually create new business models? How do I actually start to, to understand that there's gonna be a different way people use things in the future? So, you know, you could be, taking one technology to just change how you order food or how you order transport, 
but you could have another piece of technology that says, well, I'm going to accept that in 10 years time, the car buying generation won't want to buy cars in the same way. So how am I going to use technology to drive new models for doing business and how people are going to consume transportation? So I think that that duality is interesting. The, the people who are looking to completely transform by building a new business model, that's been really interesting to watch. And I think you'll see more focus on that coming out over the next three to five years as people realize the the power that they've got based on being able to harness all that data and understand the trends in that data and how that's affecting their business. That's going to be a, a key to how people actually digitally transform. All right. Thanks for joining us. And uh, is there anything I didn't ask that I should have? No, I really enjoyed it, Larry. It was a, it was a great interview. Thank you very much. Great. Thanks a lot.